In the last few years, you might have seen a lot of posts, videos and documentaries claiming that the food industry is one of the main threats to the environment and that the best thing you can do to reduce your impact is going vegan or at least vegetarian. In this video, I want to analyze the problem with you, understand it more and try to create a list of factors that we need to consider when we choose our food. First of all, we need to consider that the problem of food impact is not an easy one. So let's start from something very simple like this tomato. What is the impact of this tomato? How can we assess it? What factors should we consider? This is the very first question to answer and it's the most important one because if you use different methods you will end up with different results. One scientist might say, okay let's consider the fuel burned by the tractor that is needed by the farmer to farm this tomato. But another scientist could say, okay that's all right but let's also consider something else. Let's consider fertilizers that we're using on the field because fertilizer have an impact on the field and also needs a lot of energy to be produced. And why don't we also consider the steel that is needed to build the machinery that the farmer uses. As you can see these two scientists will end up with very different results. This is only talking about energy still. So imagine what happens when you not only consider the impact of for climate change but you also consider other kind of impacts like land use, fertilizer use and so and then releasing nitrogen in the soil and in the waters and many other factors that you could consider. And remember, we're still talking only about a tomato. Imagine what happens when you need to compare very different foods grown on different soils in different countries, shipped to different places far away in the world and sold in different shops after a certain amount of cold storage. You need to consider all these factors. So I spent the first few minutes of the video to explain you just how difficult this problem can be. I did this because I want you to understand that even if you find different results in the literature, this doesn't mean that those scientists were stupid or didn't know what they were doing. It's just that they made different assumptions or that they're trying to analyze different tomatoes. Uh, I say this because lately people seem to think that if you don't get the same numbers everywhere, it means that even scientists don't know anything about that field and there's nothing you can say. And this is not the case. Even if you find very different results, you can still draw a lot of conclusions from those studies. In this graph, you can read the global warming potential for different foods obtained by different studies. Each dot is the value obtained by a certain study. On the horizontal axis, you can read the amounts of CO2 equivalent emitted to produce one kilogram of protein from that source of food. Now you can see that for, for foods like beef and sheep, there is a very wide range of possibilities, so some studies find smaller values than other studies. Even if there's so much difference between different studies, it is still very clear that in, in average beef and sheep uh, have an impact compared to eggs, pig or chicken. And that the vegetable proteins are the ones with the lowest impact. Okay, now that we understand how difficult the problem is, let's break it into smaller pieces to make it easier. So let's create a list of criteria that we need to follow when we buy our food. And let's start from the most important one. So we're going in the, in the crazy order of importance. The most important thing will be the kind of food. So no matter how it's transported, no matter where it's created, no matter how it's stored, if you're buying meat every day and if you're eating beef and sheep every day, your impact is gonna be very high. So let's make a list. The worst thing possible is beef together with big fish like salmon and codfish. Talking about meat, after, after beef comes probably sheep according to many studies. Then you have pig, then uh, other kind of meats, and the last kind of meat, the best one, is chicken. Talking about seafood, usually big fish is worse and small fish are better, like mackerel or herrings. Usually clams are pretty good, and in general food grown in aquacultures is better than fish caught in fisheries. Then you have the vegetable proteins, which are usually very good and have a very low impact. You might have noticed that most of these graphs uh, consider not kilograms of food but kilograms of proteins and this is because most people who want to become vegetarian and vegan will have to change their source of proteins so that's why the comparison is made talking about proteins because so people can understand what they're trading the meat for now let's talk about the second most important factor that for me is the time of the year when you eat the food and let's talk about this tomato again so tomato grows usually in very warm climates so for example in places like Europe it can grow probably in July, August and September and yet we find these things in the supermarket every day all year long. So how is this possible? There are three possibilities. Possibility number one they're produced very far away from your country and they need to be transported from that country to your country. Second option is 
they are produced in your country in the right season but then they need to be stored and they need a very controlled environment with low temperatures and certain humidity for a long for maybe month third option is they're they're produced in your country but they're producing greenhouses and so they can be produced not only in just three months but also maybe in five six months of the year and sometimes those greenhouses need to be heated with uh, energy so so all of these activities heating up greenhouses transporting from far away or storing in a cold environment all of these need a lot of energy and this is why in my opinion the second best thing you can do is eat all your fresh vegetables and fruits in the months when they're naturally ripe in your country let's talk a little more about transportation because i was surprised to find out that actually it's not that important usually only 10 percent of the energy that is needed in the life cycle of a pro food product is consumed during transportation so you could say that it's not that important it's not and so that's why it's not the first factor it's the third factor however we need to point out that some particular foods actually have a very big impact because of their transportation and i'm talking about the foods that are transported by airplane and this is usually fresh vegetables and fruit that come from very far away so try to avoid this kind of food for example avoid tropical fruit if you live in northern countries and try to know where your food comes from and to avoid food that comes to, from too far away so my advice for people who live in countries that are dependent on other countries for food imports is try to only import food that is very dense in energy and nutrients for example nuts dehydrated fruit and cereals because for example one kilo of bananas will last you two days one kilo of dehydrated bananas can last you one month and will not even go bad now packaging this is not really important because other parts of the life cycle of food are, are much worse on the environment than packaging. But still, if you find two very similar foods and one has less packaging than the other, just buy the one with less packaging and try to choose the packaging which is easier to recycle. Another factor that you might want to consider is uh, the labels that you can find on food. For example, organic labels or sustainability labels. I didn't talk about this before, so I didn't put them among the very relevant factors because not necessarily they give you exact information on the sustainability of the product. For example, there are some studies that have found that organic food is not always better than a traditional industrial food. It usually is better on some parameters and worse on other parameters. Like it can be better if it uses less fertilizers, but it may be worse because it uses more land to produce the same amount of food. When you see your label, go back home, Google it and try to understand what it means so that you don't just buy something because it has a label and looks pretty but you really understand what's behind and if it actually makes a difference so let's answer the final question is going vegan the best thing you can do to help the environment? probably yes but it's not necessary and at the same time it's not enough so if you're vegan you still need to remember to avoid buying mangoes and avocados or other things that come from thousands of kilometers away maybe by plane and if you love animal food you don't need to cut it to zero you can still eat some some of it once in a while and you will still have made a very big improvement or you can forget everything you learned in this video and still try to believe that you're a good person bye